speaker uh, is Fernando Perez. Uh, he's at the University of California, Berkeley, and he's going to talk about Jupiter technology. Uh, so, Fernando, if you can share well, your screen. Thank you, Albert, uh, for the invitation, and thanks to the organizers, Greg and, the, and Lynn and the rest of the team, uh, for, uh, for inviting me. Mm. So I would like to talk a little bit about uh, Project Jupiter, um, the computational tools that we build and the, and the project from a sort of from an earth science perspective. Um, I'll start with a little bit of a connection to see you um, to see you Boulder. I actually um, I actually am uh, a graduate of CU. I did my PhD in physics at CU and I did my postdoc there. So I have I have a lot of connections to, to Boulder and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and actually my co-director in the project, Brian Granger, uh, was also a graduate of CU physics. Um, so there's there's a lot of, of us who are connected to, to the university. And um, but I also did spend a lot of time procrastinating and during my PhD, part of it in the mountains, like everyone else in Boulder, uh, and part of it writing, uh, writing code. And in fact, some of these things that we'll be talking about started um, at CU Boulder. The screenshot on the left is the very first part of the, uh, of the beginning of IPython when I first put it out. And you can actually still make out my, my colorado.edu email address from the physics server there. This was a little 250 line, nine lines of code script that I put out in 2001 uh, to basically allow me to use tools interactively. I wanted to be able to explore interactively my code, my data, uh, my analysis as part of my PhD in a way similar to say Math Mathematic or MATLAB, but, uh, but with open source tools. And I wanna emphasize that from the very beginning, uh, these tools were a collaborative effort. When I put this code out, what I did was I later quickly found that two other scientists had built similar things, uh, an oceanographer in Germany and a computer science graduate student at uh, Caltech. And uh, they allowed me to merge what I was doing with their codes to put basically the first real working version of IPython that wasn't a toy uh, to the community as a, the union of three open source, uh, three open source tools. And uh, um, that's how it started, uh, telling my advisor that I was going to take an afternoon uh, to hack a little bit and that I would uh, be back the next day to finish my dissertation. 20 years later, we see announcements from um, teams as large as Microsoft who say that they're building the planetary computer for uh, studying environmental sustainability, and, and it's all a bunch of basically Jupiter hot technology. So it's definitely been an interesting path, and some of that is what I want to discuss here. Perhaps one perspective, uh, it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but, but not completely, is to think of Jupiter as sort of the operating system for interactive data science, for when humans are in the loop and they're trying to think about their data and their problems. Um, I love this way in which the, 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 the documentation team at the Turing Institute kind of presented Jupiter to the community. Um, it's, a, it's a project that contains a, a human community, and that's critically important, that produces tools, uh, tools that we're going to see um, a little bit more of uh, in a minute. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's important to frame uh, these problems in this way because a lot of the issues we have with scientific software, and some of them will probably be discussed today, uh, really have to do with, uh, with issues that go beyond the software. Open source software is a lot more than code on GitHub. Um, and in Jupyter, we've kind of taken the time to understand that structure. Uh, and I think it's useful to, to reason about these as separate layers, that there's uh, there's services and content um, that is important. Many people come to our tools because of what they enable them to do, not because they're interested in the tools themselves. Some of us do enjoy building the tools, but not everyone does. Um, and Jupyter, for example, the, the software supports uh, supports uh, sharing of notebooks online, sharing of entire computational environments, deploying uh, Jupyter uh, as a service for others in your community. All of these things are not exactly the software itself, but rather the, the but rather the, the domain specific content, data analysis, education, et cetera, research, et cetera, that they care for. And, uh, and it, takes, it takes effort to develop kind of that, that layer of infrastructure to have impact in the community. Um, and in Jupyter, we've also gone in the opposite direction, not just in providing services, but rather the opposite, which is abstracting away the ideas that are in our code into uh, um, kind of openly formalized and documented standards and protocols. And so the way in which the internals of Jupyter work were documented as a protocol and then implemented in languages like Julia and R, and by making them open standards, uh, over a hundred different communities have developed um, implementations of the Jupyter machinery in their own programming languages so that they can reuse the ecosystem, they can grow in the same ecosystem, but with their choice of programming language. Um, 
And finally, the bottom layer of these ideas uh, is, uh, not, uh, is neither software implementations nor even abstract standards. It's actually the people who make all of this happen. Uh, and it turns out that we as scientists aren't exactly trained in large team management, fundraising. I mean, we're, we know how to write regular grants, but not large scale fundraising across industry, um, connection, how to maintain, for example, the balance of, of uh, equitable power between corporations as large as Google or Amazon uh, and single individuals who are contributing as, as personal volunteers. And so it takes a lot of effort to construct the, the infrastructures for governing uh, and managing these, uh, these types of efforts in a healthy way. And this is, um, there was no course on large scale distributed community management in my particle physics PhD at CU for one thing. Um, and, uh, but it's important to really recognize the value of that community and that that by the way is where all the credit goes. So anything that I show today uh, is really not my work but it's the work of these and many, many more people uh, uh, who, contribute, um, who contribute to the project. And so when we think of these layers it may be, it may be helpful to sort of realize that the services and content that are built on top of your tools, that's where the impact goes. Um, but by generalizing the software into more abstract ideas, what you allow is for the growth of an ecosystem, an interoperable ecosystem of third parties. Um, and yes, that does take perhaps away a little bit some of your sort of central power. And, and that is something that unfortunately the incentives of science tend to force projects into trying to be overly kind of self-branding. Um, but I think that by encouraging the growth of, a, of an interoperable eco open ecosystem, in the long run, we're all better. And hopefully we can change that culture a little bit. Um, and finally, the existence of, the, of those people in that community gives you new blood, new ideas, innovation, resiliency, the ability to uh, adapt and evolve and meet uh, diverse use cases that you might not have thought of. Um, and so from this perspective, um, Jupiter is, offers a set of tools that sort of tackle, if we now do focus on the tools a little bit, because obviously they matter, um, that help you tackle what I hope is sort of a rough cartoon of the life cycle of a research idea. We explore data, we explore an idea, we explore an algorithm. Um, some, typically we start on our own. Eventually uh, we end up doing teamwork. It's rare these days that uh, single author papers are mostly a thing of the past, at least in, in many in, in the kinds of fields that I think are relevant to this audience. Mm. And so collaboration is key. Eventually, if you really, if, you, if that little idea you had is going to work, you probably at some point need to do large scale runs on HPC in the cloud, on supercomputers, um, on large cloud based analysis, and you will publish, communicate, and teach with your results, right? This is kind of the, the, the rinse and repeat cycle of science in a very idealized way. And hopefully, in Jupiter, we've, we're offering this operating system offers kind of little bits and pieces um, at all of these points that you can use to build. Um, so I imagine at this point, most of you have seen the Jupyter Notebook. It's a web-based tool that allows you to combine code uh, and the results of that code with narrative uh, in uh, using Markdown and mathematics um, into documents that actually can be shared and reproduced. Uh, but uh, that interactivity that, for example, allows you to write uh, with just one line of code, get a, li a little widget with controls here to, uh, to animate uh, the parameters of a model, for example, um, is, uh, is exactly the same infrastructure that can be used to build richer graphical user interfaces, but oriented towards research use cases. Um, and so this is an example of a project actually uh, led by folks at CU and others that was presented at the EarthCube meeting last year, where using these exact same, same interactive uh, widget tools, they've built an interface called Balto, uh, a user interface that can be uh, used immediately by the scientist in their own workflow. It's not a separate standalone application. It's a modular library call that produces the right UI for you to continue your analysis. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum is the usage of, uh, of these tools, not for uh, uh, one, um, one direct local analysis, but actually for very large scale cloud-based analysis of one of the biggest data sets we have these days, which is the CMIP6 data set. Um, and this is an example taken from Pangeo, which is a project that I'll mention a little bit later, also presented last year at the EarthCube meeting, uh, where uh, there are uh, notebooks that any of you can run. If you, if you go to that, uh, to that URL, you'll find, um, you'll find uh, links to execute these um, in cloud infrastructure to access uh, the CMIP6 data and analyze it interactively. Um, and part of the beauty of it is that we have put generic protocols to represent interactive, uh, interactively data in the, in the richest possible and kind of most informative way. And so, for example, when you call up a data set, 
what you get is not uh, some static printout. You actually get a rich clickable, uh, double clickable um, uh, collapsing HTML view that has a ton of informative data about the structure of the data set. So these are examples, uh, some examples of the, the kinds of extensions that have been built uh, on top of uh, the, our basic machinery. And today, the user interface that the project is mostly developing is called Jupyter Lab, uh, takes these lessons of these interactive workflows and tries to give scientists a highly extensible uh, kind of platform for building, uh, building custom tools that are not just notebook based, but that actually incorporate other things. Uh, data, for example, becomes sort of a first class citizen. Um, it's not only about having notebooks, but having potentially multiple views of data right there in the same interface. So as you look around your data, you may find uh, an image and you can open an image. Data tables are viewable directly as data tables. But this is an example of something that, that we've kind of thought through, which is how to access a data set in more than one way. So for example, if you open a specific JSON file that happens to be encode geospatial information as GeoJSON, you can, sure, you can view it as text. JSON is text. But if you have the right GeoJSON viewer, that same file can be viewed in this manner below. And instead of being seen as text, it's represented using a JavaScript mapping library using Leaflet uh, so that you can actually view that data in what probably is a more informative representation of that data. And uh, and these tools can be used to extend uh, to extend Jupyter Lab for many new use cases. This is this is an example of sort of high end three D visualization uh, being done right there in the browser, developed by the team at Quantstack, which is a, a startup in France. And this is another example from the same company um, of building uh, sort of a workbench for robotics, for interactive control and, and modeling of robots using ROS, which is the robotics operating system. Um, and these things have been put directly into, um, into Jupyter Lab. Um, the following is a, a short video that I'm going to show you for a second of a tool called the Fly Brain Lab. Um, so this was developed in uh, Oriel Lazar, uh, Oriel Lazar's lab um, at a, at uh, Columbia in New York. Um, and what you're going to see here, if the video uh, Dane's playing, there we go, um, is Jupyter Lab. But you see at the bottom a 3D view of a fruit fly uh, brain, and the neuronal circuits that are indicated there are actually simulated on the right as an electrical circuit. And when uh, you click, they, the user clicks on that, those those models can actually run on a dedicated specialized cluster. Um, and then on the right now, uh, a little uh, genomics uh, and kind of relevant biological information data browser has appeared that is connected, uh, that is connected to, to the same models and the same data sets. So all of those are very domain specific tools that obviously the Jupyter team has no business developing a, a 3D viewer for, uh, for brain data from fruit flies. But by making this infrastructure available, those domain scientists can add their own tools and they still have the rest of Jupyter. Right the, on the top left, it's still a normal on the top center. I'm sorry, it's still a normal notebook that they can use for the rest of their workflow as usual. So we're trying to provide precisely that kind of platform um, for exploration, uh, for collaboration. So this is something that is sort of fresh off the oven, um, and this is in the next version of Jupyter Lab. A quick demo of real-time collaborative editing and collaborative work with, with live no, uh, notebooks and computation. And so in here, I have the, those two views are actually two separate browsers uh, that are accessing the same document. They happen to be on the same machine, but, um, but they could be, you could be accessing through the browser a remote machine, say at NCAR, and you can see that the outputs are synchronized, uh, code executes and the, uh, the views appear in both. Um, as, markdown, uh, as Markdown is typed, text, uh, text and math also uh, is also synchronized. Um, and you can see um, in here, once uh, I probably should have typed a little bit faster yesterday when I recorded this, uh, but you can see how both edits can be made in both places. So down below, now we're editing in the second view and we're modifying the math and quickly the, the real-time preview and the first one updates. If I change the parameters of the plot here, I re-execute and then the other view shows the updated plot. So it's a fully synchronized uh, view of a real-time collaborative environment for science. Um, it's coming, you can play with it right now if you, if you go to that URL. 
<laughs> you can play with it. Um, and continuing on kind of this, this line of ideas, okay, well, after collaboration, you want to run in production. Um, if any of you work at NCAR, you can go to jupiterhub.ncar.ucar.edu, and those are the resources uh, where Jupiter Hub allows you, uh, where NCAR offers you a Jupiter Hub that allows you to log in. Um, and this one hits very close to home. Part of my uh, appointments and affiliations are with LBNL. Um, and a few days ago, Roland Thomas was one of the <coughs> scientists at NERSC posted this first notebook on the system. Um, and if you look here, he's printing the, the host name of the machine. This is Perlmutter. This is the next generation, the new machine that is being commissioned at NERSC, uh, uh, the new supercomputer at NERSC that's going to replace Corey that's coming online. I think I got a calendar invite for the, the dedication of the machine uh, a couple days ago. Um, and so from the get-go, the one of the biggest supercomputers in the nation will be outfitted uh, with uh, the Jupyter machinery so that you can have all of this fluidity of interactive usage and with, uh, with the tools we've been uh, discussing, but sitting on really high-end production hardware for large-scale simulation. Um, and finally, well, if your ideas go anywhere, if that project where you, you had a good idea and you collaborated and you ran in production gets somewhere, you're going to want to publish your, your work and probably teach it to um, your students. And these tools also support that. So there's a there's a tool in our stack called Jupyter Book um, that makes it very, very easy to grab a collection of notebooks and turn them into a, into a book. These are a couple of examples of some of the, te the textbooks for our data science courses at UC Berkeley. And so when a student clicks on one of these books, it looks like a, a rendered web page with, uh, with text and math and figures, but they can click on that button that says open on the data hub. And when they click on that button, they land immediately without any installation of anything, they land on a hosted Jupyter hub, like the NCAR ones and NERSC ones we, uh, we were showing earlier, but in this case in the cloud, not on HPC and uh, oriented towards students. And having that kind of infrastructure allows us to teach very large scale courses at Berkeley in data science in a way that if we were doing local tech support would be unthinkable. Um, so these are uh, pictures from a couple of years ago, obviously when we were launching these courses, uh, a few years after we launched these courses, but when we could still do them in person, um, they are, they I finished teaching this uh, last fall uh, and we had about 12, 1300 students for data 100 that were, that were obviously uh, virtual. But uh, with these courses, uh, what we're doing is we're reaching kind of about half of the campus, give or take. Uh, we really are, these courses are growing very rapidly and we're reaching a lot of people on campus. Uh, and it's pretty remarkable that, that, uh, that we can do that. Mm. And, uh, and these tools are being used in the, in the earth sciences community extensively. Um, here are two examples of textbooks on earth environmental data science from uh, Ryan Abernathy and uh, Brian Rose at uh, U Albany. Um, but again, connection, local connections to CU, the earth, Leah Vassar, who um, I imagine many of you know at the earth lab, um, leads the development of open educational uh, materials for earth sciences um, in Python that use, use all of this machinery. Um, and our colleagues at NCAR, um, have actually just teamed up with, uh, with Brian Rose, precisely this person, to build a new project called Project Pythia that will develop educational materials for earth sciences as well uh, in, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this stack. Um, and the example is on the right is from a colleague at UC Berkeley, uh, who's a paleomagnetism expert. Um, and kind of finally, if, uh, if all of this works, we have, we have a beautiful we have a beautiful kind of combination of tools and ideas that that hopefully you can you can make use of that hopefully serve your research needs. Um, but one last point that I think is becoming very apparent is the importance of the infrastructure that this runs in. Um, Pangeo is a project that I'm sure many of you know. This is a quick interactive example of the, what Pangeo enables. A scientist is zooming into an image something happens, it gets fuzzy, there's some color bars for a second, and then after a few seconds, the image sharpens in the notebook. What's the big deal? Uh, well, the big deal is that this is about 100 gigs of Landsat imagery uh, in the state of Washington, and the little bars at the bottom are a whole distributed cluster doing the analysis. For making that zoom, you had to run a lot of code at scale. Pangeo is a project that takes Jupyter, Dask, and X-Array and assembles them into a stack that lets scientists concentrate immediately on their science rather than becoming cloud engineers at Amazon or Google or, or Microsoft. Um, in Europe, the European Commission at the, the, uh, the JRC, the, uh, the Joint Research Center, I think it's called, in Italy, they've developed a Jupyter, also a Jupyter Lab-based uh, large-scale uh, platform for interactive analysis of geospatial data that is absolutely fascinating. It has a weird name, uh, G-A-O-D-P-P, something like that. But it's a really interesting development precisely along these lines. 
Uh, we have a project funded by EarthCube that kind of tries to connect precisely scientific use cases uh, in, uh, in geosciences uh, on the Pen Jupiter and Pengeo stack with the development of new ideas. Uh, uh, Anderson Beninerwe and uh, Kevin Paul are both from NCAR and so is Joe Hammond, though he's in, on leave now. So this is a, a collaboration with folks, uh, with folks from NCAR and we invite you to connect with us if, uh, if you're interested. And finally, I want to mention a new effort that we launched last year together with uh, Ryan Abernathy, actually from Pangeo, um, as well as folks from, uh, from UBC, um, which is called 2I2C. And it's a nonprofit organization that aims to precisely offer this kind of uh, these tools, but as managed infrastructure in a way that universities are not well suited for, but also that is not strictly a business. We don't want to leave all the, I mean, industry is great and we collaborate closely with many in industry, but we don't want this to be strictly a matter for, indus for industry and startups. So if you're interested, take a look at 2i2c.org and let us know if any of this can be of help to you. And I will try to stop here because I know that you have a tight schedule today. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Wow. I, and I thought I knew Jupyter Notebooks and, and what they were capable of. You showed quite a bit of new, uh, new technology there. Um, we have time for one quick question, and I see one in the chat from Fader Bard. Um, okay, so I'm going to read it for you, uh, Fernando, if, if that's okay. So Google has a less developed fork, Colab. How is the relation between Jupyter how is the relation with Jupyter projects? So Colab is a fork. Uh, we met with the team before it was even called Colab, I think. We met with that team. Colab is a fork of an early version of IPython when back, back when the name Jupyter didn't even exist. It was called IPython Notebook. This was early in the days. Um, and it implements many of the same ideas. But by this point, the problem is that Colab has moved so far into the Google infrastructure and architecture that it really is impossible to share anything. So I think it's great that there is an implementation of these ideas from, from Google and it is based originally on our code. But at this point, um, I think the best, I, I think of the Google Cloud infrastructure, the Microsoft Azure infrastructure and the Amazon infrastructure. I think of each of those as an operating system. I think of it as a computer. It's like a proprietary computer. And by this point, they sort of ported IPython into the Google APIs. It runs into their authentication system, data storage, et cetera. Um, and so it isn't particularly easy to get anything sort of back out of it. So it enhances the visibility of these ideas in the community, but it isn't something that we can directly benefit from. 